Uh, I'd like to begin with just a little more by way of uh, self-introduction. Um, as uh, perhaps was evident from uh, Erica's introduction, I come to translation studies from a background as a translator of philosophy and have published three book-length philosophy translations, but I'm mainly an academic. For over 20 years, I worked in the School of European Languages at Swansea University, where I overlapped for a couple of very rewarding years with LSE Taylor, and uh, where I was responsible for introducing an MA in literary translation back in 1996. Uh, given my intellectual background, it will perhaps come as no surprise that when I was designing the Swansea MA course, um, in addition to the practical translation modules, I naturally included as a core module a course in the history and theory of translation, which I myself taught in various incarnations over the years. Then in 2014, I moved to the University of East Anglia in Norwich to head up the British Centre for Literary Translation. And at UEA, I've introduced an undergraduate module in translation studies, which includes an overview of current translation theories. I've also taken over an MA module in translation theory from my recently retired colleague, Jean Gross Beyer. Translation theory strikes me, then, as a natural component of a literary <coughs> translation training. Um, the title of my talk, then, is The Presence of Theory in Literary Translator Training. And um, my uh, first section is has a subtitle, Who's Afraid of Translation Theory? <laughs> For two years between 2014 and 2016, BCLT was one of eight institutional partners in an Erasmus Plus funded Europe-wide collaborative project called Petra E. Uh, that's just the um, home page on where the purpose of Petra E was to draw up a framework of reference for the education and training of literary translators. The project was successful and in June 2016 culminated in the publication, both online and in hard copy, of the framework of reference in seven European <coughs> languages. You see them arrayed there on the home page, Dutch, English, French, German, Hungarian, Italian and Spanish versions, to which Bulgarian has since been added. Um, I brought along copies of the English version uh, and I'll distribute them at the end of my talk, but I'll hold on to them for now in the interest of retaining your attention for the next, for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, so, there are paper copies, there's also the complete thing online, um, and it, it looks like this. Um, the framework of reference presents a kind of hybrid model for translator training in that it's structured according to the acquisition of competencies under eight categories, transfer, language, textual, heuristic, and so on. But it also presents a learning line. So the competencies are on the um, vertical axis, the learning line horizontal, which charts a progress across five stages of development, flagged as LT1 to LT5, and they range, as you can see, from beginner through advanced learner, early career professional, advanced professional, through to expert. The whole thing amounts to a kind of council of perfection, and no individual is expected to have every competence exhaustively covered. The idea is rather that translators should be able to situate themselves somewhere on the grid, perhaps at different levels of attainment for the different categories of competence and that they can then plan their career development while educators can use the same grid to plan out their course development. To that end, uh, the hard copy leaflet was conceived from the outset as having not only the function, but also the form of a road map. And so it holds out thus. Um, we can perhaps talk later in the question session about the Petra E project more generally. And the Petra E network that emerged from it in September last year as a continuation of its objectives. For now, though, I want to focus on one aspect of the published framework document, and that is the presence in it of translation theory. That presence is not all that substantial. The final Petra E document states that it, quote, aims to help overcome traditional boundaries between the academic and non-academic, between theory and practice. 
I should say that of the eight um, Petra E partners, uh, not all by any means were uh, academic partners, and they included, for example, the uh, European um, Translator Association Umbrella <coughs> Organization in Seattle, um, the Dodger Gazette Fond, uh, and others. Um, so the Petra E document states that it aims to overcome traditional boundaries between theory and practice, and it includes familiarity with translation theories among the various kinds of recommended research competence, so that an advanced learner can be expected to know several theories of translation. This is how translation theory finds its way into the final version of the document. Um, so an advanced learner can be expected to know several theories of translation. Um, the document doesn't state this explicitly. Um, we took it out after it was included in earlier drafts, but the advanced learner stage is intended to correspond roughly to the level of attainment and experience that a translator will have gained after they've completed a master's level university course. So the framework document envisages that translation theories will be covered on an MA, but not perhaps elsewhere, not afterwards, after um, a translator leaves university. For some, it may seem rather disappointing that translation theory is not considered appropriate for continuing professional development after university study, uh, for example, in courses or summer schools provided by translator associations. Um, but I can assure you that some of the liveliest discussions among the Petra E group concerned precisely this issue, whether translation theory should be included as a core competence expectation at all in the education and training of literary translators. In fact, I have a confession to make. The word theories did not appear in the first draft of the framework, and it was introduced at my suggestion. This competence and the research competence more generally proved the main fault line between the academics and the professional translators in the group. Um, the former, uh, like me, assumed it would naturally belong, and the latter, uh, foremost among whom was prize-winning Belgian translator Françoise Vimar, um, pictured with her constant companion Jason. Um, she was representing Seattle in the, uh, in the Petra E group. Françoise and others were more skeptical to say the least, so the fact that translation theories remained in the final document is a testimony to the uneasy truce that was reached between the different factions. The Petra E discussions around this topic were very instructive, I thought, for they represented the latest round in the contest which one might term resistance to theory within the translation world. I take the term, of course, from uh, Paul de Man's book of that name, The Resistance to Theory. But the phenomenon has by no means always been restricted to the world of post-structuralist high theory, and has often been an aspect of translator training too, at least in my experience. One of the first things I did when I arrived at UEA in July 2014 was attend the annual BCLT summer school, which included that year a panel discussion on teaching translation within the academy and outside the academy. I'd been invited to represent within the academy, and the main other panelist representing outside the academy was the uh, distinguished Russian-English translator uh, Robert Chandler. Um, the main fault line in that panel, too, was the question of the relevance of translation theory, um, which was disputed by a number of the translators in the room. Um, Rosalind Harvey, for example, prize-winning alumna of the UEA MA program, who went on to co-found the Emerging Translators Network in the UK, um, <coughs> confessed that although she'd enjoyed learning about translation theories as part of her MA, um, she struggled to think of a time since then when they'd been relevant. Um, still rather wet behind the ears when it came to discussions about translation theory with practicing translators, I didn't appreciate that Robert Chandler had form in this context um, in his very positive spectator review of David Bellis's Is That a Fish in Your Ear, for example, Chandler writes that, quote, translation studies as taught in universities is a highly theoretical discipline that is beyond the understanding of most practical practicing translators, let alone of the general public, close quote. Um, in his report on a Russian translation event held in Oxford in June 2013, um, UCLA's Boris Dralyuk uh, records that 
In his talk, Robert Chandler cast a cold eye on some of the less helpful developments in translation studies, arguing that there is a greater gulf between practice and theory in translation than in other fields. He pointed out that the questions posed by supposedly pioneering theorists have been with us for centuries, offering as an example the debate surrounding the translation of the Bible into English in the 16th century. He commented that the voluminous and ever-expanding body of work in translation studies could likely be boiled down to a practical five-minute talk. When the floor was open to discussion, one of the attendees noted that she heard the very same sentiment expressed by one of the leading scholars in translation theory, an interesting epilogue there. But um, anyway, Chanda is perhaps at one extreme of, a, of the spectrum among what one might call the hardcore hero skeptics. Um, but he's certainly not alone in these views, as the unnamed Oxford attendee would doubtless attest. In fact, even within translation studies, there's a certain kind of resistance to theory. Let's take as in the, another example one of the doyens of university translation studies in the UK, Peter Newmark, who was professor of translation at the University of Surrey and established the Centre for Translation Studies there before going on well into his retirement to publish a series of influential contributions to the translation studies literature in the 80s and 90s. Newmark's ambivalence about translation theory is manifest, I think, in a number of contexts. In 1992, in his regular column on translatum, uh, translation matters for the linguist, which he later collected in more paragraphs on translation, uh, he greets the appearance of the Schulter and Viganet collection of theories of translation as, quote, an imme immediately indispensable work for a student of translation. In his 1991 book about translation, Newmark has paired chapters on teaching translation and teaching about translation, making it very clear that the latter holds an important place in his curriculum. But the main course that he taught at Surrey about translation was not titled Translation Theory, rather Principles and Methods of Translation. This course he describes as central to his ideal training program, and it has a functional theory of language at its heart, he tells us, but it was explicitly not devoted to translation theory or translatology. Uh, Newmark, of course, makes his own contributions to the theoretical debates. Um, for example, his influential distinction between semantic and communicative translation. But ultimately, he's ambivalent about the notion of translation theory, preferring a more practical, old-fashioned, prescriptive stance. As he puts it in more paragraphs on translation, why translation theory? Not to propound theories of translation, but mainly to help people who translate to make decisions by indicating all the possible choices and their merits and demerits and making recommendations. As a final example of this trend, let me cite my own former colleague, uh, Jean Bosbeyer, who, like Newmark, set up an MA in translation, the MA in tra literary translation at UVA, which is still going strong, I'd like to say, um, and which includes a module in translation theory. But in uh, Bosbeyer's essay, Who Needs Theory, which serves as the introduction to the 2010 continual collection, Translation Theory and Practice in Dialogue, she lays down the gauntlet and seeks to counter what she calls the danger of poorly applied, naive translation theory, arguing that, quote, a theory of translation is potentially more dangerous to translation practice than a theory of meaning, of literature, of the text, or of the reader. By which she means, quote, theory has too often been ignored by practitioners or has been somewhat naively applied. So instead she makes a counter-proposal. This is uh, from Jean Bosbeyer's 2010 essay, Who Needs Theory? I'm arguing against the naive, unconsidered application of theory, and even against any direct application of translation theory to the act of translation. Such theories are not meant to be sets of instructions, and they serve translators, including the best poet translators, badly when so used. Let us instead take on peripheral theories, text, the context, the reader, the effects of history, the nature of literature. They're more interesting, more useful, and far less dangerous. 
theorists like Newmark and both Bayer then justify their paradoxical resistance to theory on the grounds that they favor borrowing from other kinds of theorizing, respectively theory of language and cognitive stylistics, in order to apply them in the field of translation studies. At the same time, disowning the theories that have grown up within translation studies itself as, at least potentially, too extreme, beyond the pale, unhelpful, or even dangerous. This seems to me a curious position to adopt. So what I want to focus on in the rest of my paper today are the arguments for including translation theory in the literary translator training program. I'll necessarily be speaking about training at universities, and of course, as someone who's been teaching translation theory at universities for over 20 years, I'm very much parti pris, and I don't imagine it's giving much away to say that I think there is a value in exposing young and emerging translators to translation theory as part of their formal university course. It's important to rehearse the arguments from time to time, though, and to reflect on our practice as the landscape changes. After all, if we can't justify including translation theory in a crowded curriculum for literary translation students, then we're literally wasting their time, which might otherwise be better spent perhaps on more translation practice, or even, dare I say it, a core module in translation technology for literary translators. But that's a whole other can of worms. What kinds of theoretical training are currently available then? What are we talking about when we talk about translation theory in the classroom? Above all, what are the resistors resisting? We need, I think, to define translation theory before we go any further. And above all, we need to distinguish between different modes of what Newmark calls talking or teaching about translation. They're not all, by any means, I would say, theory. After all, there's quite a spectrum between practical translation exercises on the one hand and high theory on the other. It's a spectrum that encompasses, say, annotating translation choices or comparing existing translations, everything that goes under the name of translation criticism or comparison or analysis, which I would want to separate off from what one might call translation theory proper. There is much here that is surely unobjectionable and is not targeted by those resistant to theory. After all, they're not resistant to the aim of reflecting on translations, otherwise what on earth would a university course be for? <coughs> this kind of theorizing about translation is surely inescapable, and Anthony Pym, in Exploring Translation Theories, argues that translators are theorizing all the time. He makes a useful distinction between theorizing and theory, which I will also adopt. These diverse theorizing practices are reflected in the different kinds of rubric we have for assessments at UEA. Uh, usually we offer three kinds of option, namely a new translation with commentary, a practical analysis of existing translations, and a theoretical discussion. So three kinds of uh, assessment option, um, each set out in a different space on this what I'm calling a spectrum between practical translation exercises and high theory, which also includes translation history and the history of reflection on translation, um, which for the majority of its course is no more than that, reflection on translation, and I would say also does not deserve the name of translation theory, or for that matter, claim it. Uh, but the history of translation consists rather for uh, large tracts of time in translators getting self-reflexive about the activity of translation, writing relatively impressionistic prefaces, and attempting to prescribe the best method of translation on the basis of first-hand experience. A textbook like Jeremy Monday's Introducing Translation Studies, Theories and Applications is typical in that it devotes only one 20-page chapter of 12 in a 400-page book to translation theory before the 20th century, while Dems exploring translation theories eschews a historical dimension almost entirely and limits itself to the main paradigms of Western translation theories since the 1960s. To offer a great many different ways of talking about translations which are not highly theoretical, and it can't be these things that the anti-theorists are objecting to. 
Of course, historically, there never was any translation theory in the classroom. And for the most part, there still isn't on an explicit level, at least. Undergraduate modules within modern languages courses tend to be taught as linguistic exercises and don't even use a textbook for practical translation classes. A textbook like uh, Hervé Higgins' Thinking German Translation or Newmark's A Textbook of Translation. Um, as Lawrence Venuti puts it in the introduction to his recent collection, Teaching Translation, this is Venuti, the instrumental model of translation remains so entrenched in academic institutions that a hermeneutic approach has yet to be developed and widely applied in all its conceptual and practical ramifications. So the claim is that um, most of the work that's being done uh, on and with translations uh, at universities is being done so uh, without a, a accompanying reflection on uh, the status uh, and the production and so on of those translations. We might want to come back to <coughs> this question in the discussion too, but I want to focus now more squarely on MA modules which explicitly thematize translation theory. From a certain perspective, the presence of translation theory in the MA curriculum is easy enough to explain, for within the academic environment, one important function classes in translation theory serve is to make the discipline academically respectable in the first place, proving that it is not just translator mm -hmm. training, sorry, I should put that in scare quotes, translator training, uh, conveying techniques, but that it also possesses analytical and conceptual rigor. There will always be the wrong reasons for offering translation theory modules, and I think this is one of them. For example, when academic teachers who have not themselves translated, or not for a long time, and might even look down on translation itself in the traditional fashion as an ancillary pursuit, when such teachers offer translation theory instead, instead of a translation module perhaps, because it is an area which you can truly get your teeth into and make a research contribution to. This is, in other words, another of the ways in which, in the UK at least, the perceived primacy of research in recent years has, I think, been skewing the agenda. That's certainly how the UK Research Excellence Framework and the Research Assessment Exercise before it has viewed translation work thus far, with the result that uh, no one in, academic, in academia really wants to do translations anymore, and this is a real problem. Um, I was able to submit book-length translations to the RAE in 1996, in 2001, and 2008, but only because in each case I was citing as the research output a substantial introductory essay which happened to have a book-length translation attached. Hopefully the greater recognition for translation as research, for which BCLT and other organisations are currently lobbying the Research Excellence Framework, not to speak of the new Teaching Excellence Framework, will make a material difference here. Um, this is the Translation as Research Manifesto, published in late 2015, on the Modern Languages Open site at uh, Liverpool University, and if you're not yet familiar with it, I'd certainly urge you to read it, to subscribe to its goals, and to spread the word. Irrespective of the reasons for which they're being offered, translation theory modules will always appeal to the kind of student who's not looking to develop a career in literary translation after university, but is simply interested in a module's intellectual content, Say, I have an interest in the history, the linguistics, the philosophy, the rhetoric, the cultural theory. Most translation theory nowadays, after all, is descriptive rather than prescriptive. It's not explicitly intended to aid the budding translator to hone their translation skills, but is instead intended for translation analysis. And it's by no means necessary for the analyst to have generated the translation in the first place. Translation theory, in other words, is an aspect of translation studies and as such has a number of kinds of academic value, including training students to go on to further graduate study and perhaps embark on a PhD program. Introducing his book Exploring Translation Theories, which draws on the experience of teaching courses in translation theory at different universities across three continents, Anthony Pym is quite unapologetic about targeting an academic audience with a book that will be of only relatively incidental interest to professional translators. Um, the book is not primarily designed to make anyone a better translator, it's mainly for academic work. 
although it should be accessible to anyone interested in arguments about translation, and most translators are. Nonetheless, I'd like now to turn to the question of translation theory modules within a translator training program and ask what budding translators might get out of them beyond a formal academic interest. What kinds of benefit am I expecting my students to derive for their practical translation activity from pursuing a more theoretical module? To put it another way, what arguments are there for persuading someone who is interested in practical translation activity that they should take an interest in translation theory too? Um, at this point, I think we have to acknowledge that translation theory, which I've been treating rather monolithically so far, itself, of course, covers a spectrum. Um, a spectrum of theoretical approaches, then, which ranges from the least to the most distant from the practical context. If we follow Newmark and consider first linguistic theories, such as uh, Mona Baker's In Other Words, with its consideration of questions of anaphora, cohesion and coherence, or Newmark's own textbook of translation, such work doesn't usually, I think, even come under the heading of translation theory. Instead, it's seen as equipping students with a vocabulary and a methodology which will come in handy perhaps soon after their university career has finished in enabling them to describe what they're doing in translating to clients as necessary. Um, other very practically edged theories, such as think aloud protocols, come under the same heading as do fields which interface markedly with technological developments such as theory of audiovisual translation. At the risk of wanton oxymoron, these are theories at the more practical end of the spectrum, which provide translators with new perspectives and vocabularies for talking directly about their translation practice. We jump to the opposite extreme. We might consider very abstruse theories such as Walter Benjamin's landmark essay, The Task of the Translator, or very obviously outdated pre-linguistic theory, which would appear at least to be very distant indeed from the concerns of the practical translator today. Even the most apparently abstruse of theories can have practical application though. For example, I find the Benjamin essay the most taxing to teach because it's the most philosophical material that I give my students. And yet it's provocative opening, any translation which intends to perform a transmitting function cannot transmit anything but information, hence something inessential. A well-known uh, quote from the opening of Benjamin's essay, that opening always works like a charm, I find, in getting students to think about the importance or otherwise of the communication of the message in a translation. Much modern translation theory is very dismissive of earlier attempts at theoretical formulation, of course. And the translation theories which have tried hardest to be helpful are usually the most historically bound and look the most outdated. For example, Etienne Dolé in, in 1540, writing at the dawn of vernacular translation from Latin and telling his readers, you must preserve all conjunctions. All adverbs must be placed next to the verb and so on. Of course, this seems laughable now, um, if it didn't at the time. In the case of such misguided, superseded recipes for correct translation from times past, or, say, blind alleys in the history of the development of machine translation, even looking at negative examples such as these helps students to conceptualize and validate what they're doing now, and not to take it for granted. It helps them to think about what a practical translator does take as a rule of thumb, what principles they generally do adopt, and it helps students not to reinvent the wheel. The great advantage of this kind of theory is that students get to question what they otherwise take to be natural and realize that it's a product of a historical formation. Translation theory serves as a way of contextualizing historically and obliging students to realize that translation practice is never theory-free in any case, but historically determined. Even criteria of translation quality are historically formed. They have, to use Venuti's Nietzschean coinage, a genealogy. Talking of Venuti, it's always fun to present theories of foreignization to students and get them to think that fluency might be a problem. Um, a lot follows on from that realization pedagogically, even if the student will then go on to cleave to the fluent model. Likewise, 
getting a student to realize that domestication and foreignization is a continuum along which they can choose where to place themselves and to decide which point is suitable for a particular text type. Which theory goes down best in the translation classroom? Um, you may have found differently. I find that without a doubt, Venuti, um, arguments about the translator's invisibility and how to counter it. Cultural translation theories in general have sensitized translation students to the context of translation and made translators more sensitive to cultural difference. I found that many other translation theories are well received and well applied by students too, such as theories of translational action, which uh, we heard about in uh, this morning's first talk. Um, Scorpos theory and other functional theories that foster an awareness that translations need to be fit for particular purposes. They help to bridge between the artificial context of the classroom and the real world context of the translation industry. The theory of translation norms helps students to contextualize better their own situation and it thus empowers the individual translator or helps them to a better understanding of the limits of that empowerment. But an exposure to translation theories brings them into contact with eminently practical problems too, such as why retranslate, or how to avoid translation ease, or the reasons why translated versions should be shorter, and so on, building their practical confidence directly. Does this all make for better translations? Will a translator translate better if they're clued up about theory. Um, him is at best wary of this proposition. Um, we can, I hope, uh, discuss this afterwards. But uh, instructors and trainers, here I'm quoting uh, uh, exploring translation theories again. Instructors and trainers sometimes assume that a translator who knows about theories will work better than one who knows nothing about them. As far as I know, there is no empirical evidence for that claim, and there are good reasons to doubt its validity. Following this line of argument, we could, I suppose, try to make meaningful the distinction that is observed in the full title of the Petri E framework, i.e. between the education and training of literary translators, conceding that translation theories belong on the education side and have no place in a program of training. That's not a distinction I would care to observe, though, for I think we can be less modest and more ambitious about our claims for the benefits of teaching translation theory to literary translators in training. In this respect, I think it's highly instructive that the Chartered Institute of Linguists includes a section on the importance of translation theory in the handbook that they provide to candidates for their diploma in translation exams. Now, as they themselves immodestly admit, the DipTrans is, quote, the gold standard for translation professionals. And the DipTrans exams consist entirely of a sequence of practical translation assignments. Yet, candidates are told that in preparing for them, they should seek out courses which include a theoretical component. So here's an extract from the uh, handbook for candidates. So the section, the section on the importance of translation theory, once priority should be given to the practice of translation, this is when you're looking to find a course to prepare you for taking the exams, with feedback on the quality of their translations, Candidates should have an awareness of theory and an understanding of how this theory should be applied. Aspects of translation theory that candidates may find helpful in their preparation for the diploma include an understanding of the dynamics of translating, i.e. a consideration of source text of author, expected readership and the cultural setting of the source and type of languages, the search for translation equivalences and other translation procedures such as transfer and naturalization, types of register and style, I won't read it all out, but an awareness of translation problems and possible solutions to specific problems, and finally, an awareness of text typology and types of translation, in particular, of the appropriateness of semantic as opposed to communicative translation. If we ask, well, why should the dip trans candidate need such a grounding in theory? It's clear from elsewhere in the handbook that it's not because they're being asked to provide any kind of contextual information for the translations that they produce. They're urged explicitly to, quote, avoid using translators' notes unless they're absolutely necessary. 
No, the CIOL clearly thinks that professional translators will simply produce better work if, for example, they are aware of the variety of possible translation approaches, such as, to take that last bullet point, Newmark's distinction between semantic as opposed to communicative translation, and are able then to tailor the translations that they produce to the respective demands of the commissioning context. Translation theories are not generally practical recipes or even rules of thumb, but what Newmark calls guiding principles. And it's not, I think, a waste of valuable curriculum time to introduce students to them. They'll doubtless continue to be those who view translation theory as an unnecessary luxury at best and a waste of time at worst. There's a great deal of resistance to translation theory out there, and I hitherto mainly experienced it as a UK phenomenon, chalked it up to phlegmatic British pragmatism in the face of continental abstraction, but Petra E. taught me that theoroscepticism is more widespread. Are such resistors to theory merely prejudiced then, anti-intellectual luddites? Certainly there are some Monsieur Jordan out, uh, out there who fail to acknowledge that theorizing is inescapable, that it's impossible to work in a theoretical vacuum, or as Mathieu Guider puts it in one of the standard French language textbooks, that traduire c'est déjà faire de la traductologie. So once you're translating, you're also engaged in translation studies. Clearly, there are some less valuable translation theories out there, too. A lot of translation studies is, at best, uh, marginally enlightening, I think. One needs to, as a, translation of translation as a teacher of translation theory, select wisely from the riches available after several decades of recent translation theorizing. My paper so far has been on the defensive, on the back foot, depending translation theory against the doubters and deniers. But in conclusion, I'd like to turn the question round and consider the argument that there should be more translation theory offered to students as part of university courses, since so much good theory has been produced in recent decades. In years to come, I think it's highly likely that we'll look back on the current period as a golden age in translation theory. So it's perhaps incumbent on contemporary educators to expose students to the best that's on offer. I'll give you an example uh, from Sun Yifeng and Moulay, who go so far as to argue that translation studies in China is being held back by the relative paucity of theoretical approaches. I wanted, particularly in the context of uh, this conference, to bring in this international comparison at the end here. There seems to be a growing recognition, they say, that an excessive and myopic concentration on translation practice or empirical research only impedes the development of translation studies in China. Perhaps resistance to theory is mainly a Western concern. One can have too much of a good thing, though, and at UEA we have no plans to roll out further translation theory modules at master's level. I'll close by mentioning a couple of trends in our thinking at UEA, though. On the one hand, we're always looking to connect theory with practice and to try to abolish the ultimately rather artificial divide between them. So at master's level on the Literary Translation Masters, we link the history and theory module to another two compulsory modules, process and product in translation and case studies, both of which, as the titles imply, have a more practical bent. Similarly, at second year undergraduate level, I introduced a module called Reading and Writing Translations, which sets theory in the context of the production of students' own translation work. But we've also been thinking beyond the MA and considering that Part J, the Petra E. framework, translation theory might yet be an appropriate aspect of continuing professional development for translators beyond the stage of formal education. We've been rethinking our annual summer school and introducing more theoretical perspectives there. At all levels of the framework, the Petra E framework, the relation between translation theory and practice is constantly changing and constantly in need of recalibrating, which is by way of saying that the published framework is doubtless already in need of more modification, but I see that as only a positive dynamic. Thank you.
student zones is it sort of how far do you think all this applies to students uh, or professionals in literary translation as opposed to other kinds of translation? Um, I think, I mean, my own experience is of, yes, trying to teach translation theory in the context of mainly <coughs> literary translation. And it's clear that, you know, some theories lend themselves better uh, to the analysis of uh, literary um, translations than others. Um, I think uh, certainly my own uh, research interest is largely historical and I mean, uh, if it looks back at the history of translation theory then there's, uh, you know, it's, it's literary translation or not much else um, that, that is the object of, of analysis and um, discussion. I think what's interesting is, you know, then to think, well, if one takes historical translation theories, how relevant are they still? And how not not just in the sense that time has passed, but also that there is so much more variety in the practice of translation now for theories to need to apply to. And so, yes, those new materials um, have generated their own translation theories. I mentioned uh, audiovisual translation in, in passing, but of course already today um, we've, we've had a glimpse into uh, the, the kind of new vistas of analysis uh, that, that that has um, uh, opened up. I think uh, that's, it's a question which is probably the most live question for me still at the moment, is precisely what I, I formulate it as um, are, what translation theories are, are most suited to literary translation. Um, and I think um, it's part of a kind of ongoing agenda that we're developing at uh, BCLT about um, considering what might be specific about literary translation itself. I mean, what ways literary translation differs from other kinds of translation and does it need to appropriate for itself um, specific translation theories? Um, so that's part of, a, yeah, it's part of an ongoing uh, uh, question that we're uh, exploring. It's interesting, you mentioned the, the, the historical perspective and, uh, and the fact that most of the history of translation theory is about literary translation, but at the same time we can look at the concept of literature which didn't exist when we, when we started uh, translating the Bible. So yeah. that wouldn't be literary translation theory as such. It could be uh, an interesting comparison of, of concepts and how we conceptualize it today, something that wasn't in fact born as a literary translation theory, but yes. now we place it. There, because now it's yes, sure. I mean, I, I was kind of um, talking about one side of literary translation theory, the theory part, and thinking that uh, over much of the historical uh, period, you know, that translation theory would not have wanted to call itself theory. Um, but similarly, as you say quite rightly, over that historical period, uh, much of what we now consider literature wouldn't have considered itself that either. I mean, there are questions of you know, the development of reading the Bible as literature since uh, the 19th century, which allow for a certain range of literary critical techniques, of course. But then, you know, what we're looking, going back to that, that earlier point about I mean, developing a, an agenda for um, literary translation theory, uh, as perhaps distinct from other kinds, um, uh, that I would consider literary translation theory to be uh, one of that toolbox of uh, literary critical theories. So in other words, it's, it's part of why I enjoy BCLT being in the institutional context that it has at, at uh, UEA, which is it's not within modern languages, but it's within a department, a school of literature, drama, and creative writing. And, uh, and so we have two MA programs at UEA. We also have an MA in Applied Translation Studies, but that's in a separate school. So we run our MA in Literary Translation, and we do our thing in the British Centre for Literary Translation within a context of creative writing, of, uh, of literary criticism, and of drama. And that's, you know, that, that's basically unique, certainly within the UK. And so what we're, you know, what we're developing then is a research program which is kind of adequate to that institutional context, and exploring then how that enables us to do um, literary translation itself differently, but literary translation theory too. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Any questions? Comments? Yeah, I think 
going to use some kind of personal reflections, I substituted the, the CIOL handbook instead, um, but um, no, I certainly thought about that. I thought about, well, you know, does the translator translate better with the knowledge of theory? Do I feel that I translate better uh, with this amount of exposure to translation theory? Certainly when I, when I did my first book back in 1993, most of this uh, you know, most of the field was as yet uh, uh, unknown to me, and so... Is that Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, that was a book of French right, philosophical analysis of a German, a German philosopher, um, and so it had its own kind of theoretical uh, uh, considerations. Um, but I think, you know, looking back, um, I feel now that I'm able to conceptualize better what I was doing at the time. And I think rather now that um, I, you know, I, I look forward to the, you know, each new translation because I think, it, I feel that it does help me to translate better, um, particularly actually for emerging translators, for translators at the beginning of their career. The point that I was making in my talk about how you know, it, it helps you not reinvent the wheel. It helps you to have the confidence to know that. I, mean, I love teaching, um, you know, I mentioned you know, validity on domestication and foreignization, but uh, you know, I use the example um, in, in Venuti's uh, translation of invisibility of, of the Zhukovsky's translation uh, for mnemic translations of Latin. And when, you know, when uh, young translators, translation students, when they read that material, they kind of become aware of a possibility of, of translating which they probably were not aware of before. Um, and it's, I, I view that as you know, translation theory for me then, probably above all, is a way of presenting a panoply of approaches. And, and often very practical approaches and ways of uh, bolstering students, translation students' um, confidence in, in what they're doing because they're able to uh, justify it to themselves and then can go on to justify you know, to anyone else who needs persuading. I think it's really useful to have a definition of what we mean by translation theory. But I feel that theory is quite a slippery term, isn't it? I feel that maybe different people are talking about different things. I have a colleague or a friend once said, theory is what academics use to talk to each other. <laughs> kind of all we used to communicate with each other. So maybe that's some of the resistance. Is because people outside that language that is used to communicate with each other don't understand it and think it's just a high quality language. Yeah. Whereas yours seems to indicate a much your definition seems to indicate something much more useful. Well thank you. Um yeah, I mean I think I've always, you know, I've been teaching courses in translation theory for, for a, a long time now, and yet I always kind of start, you know, a, 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 the historical section of a course like that by pointing out that you know for most of the historic period people didn't think that they were doing translation theory and as I said in my talk they wouldn't have wanted to claim that they were. Certainly now there's a kind of uh, historical condescension towards you know early translation theory, oh it's impressionistic, it's pre-linguistic, you know it doesn't deserve our attention anymore. I think it does but whether it deserves our attention under the name of theory capital T, I wouldn't want to argue that. I, you know, I wouldn't want to argue that there's uh, you know, that, that those theories that one could describe as what I call high theory or theory with a capital T are, are somehow uh, better. Uh, they might be better at some things, uh, but you know, plenty of areas in which they're not better, and which actually one wants a, a less theorized discourse in being able to you know, talk to a client or whatever. But I think you know, translators are always code switching, and you know, this is one area in which uh, you know which we can code switch if, if we have the. Um, we have the, you know, the experience of uh, different theoretical um, explanations and, of course, different uh, levels of practical experience as well. Um, I, 
think for me the two go together as I've been kind of becoming more experienced I think, practically um, and pedagogically through teaching also uh, my familiarity with translation theories has, has deepened and um, so it's kind of difficult for me to uh, untangle um, the three but I like the way I can look back at some of you know an earlier translation and think I'm remembering at the time I was unsure whether to make that move as a translator but now I can see that you know, I'm aware of explaining to myself retrospectively. I'm glad I took that, you know, chance. Perhaps how it felt, felt at the time. Um, usually, when one revisits one's earlier translations, one hates them and wishes they hadn't appeared. Um, but there are some advantages to uh, revisiting them too. Um, hi. Um, yes, I am. Um, I agree that the, the term theory is very difficult to define, and maybe. If we don't use the term theory, maybe it's more persuasive to those you know, colleagues who are trying to make this framework. Uh, I have this example of my student who studied with me at Portsmouth, and then she had to do a theory course, course. and then she became a project manager in a company in Tokyo. And uh, she wrote to me after she started uh, working, and she said, I'm so happy that I studied theory at the university because now I'm more confident to, ex to discuss things with my, uh, with my clients and I'm more confident in my judgment of the quality of the translation. So for her, the benefit of learning theory came after she left the MA course. So and then when you mentioned that you recognized what you did in the past afterwards. Yeah. You know, you, the afternoon, you know, different ways of explaining things. So maybe we can't expect the students to appreciate studying theory at the university level, but it will come afterwards, the benefit will come afterwards. But so maybe if you say that, that you just believe me, it will benefit you in the future, uh, you know, you have a faith in it, and yeah. Yeah. maybe that's the best we can do. I, yeah. I think that's a very good point, and, and you reminded me that when um, when we were listening to uh, George earlier on, he was talking about creative writing and about, you know, you can do creative writing at home, but what you do at university is reflect on, on creative writing. And I think, you know, translation theory is, is a wonderful opportunity if you're studying translation at university. I think what Petra has demonstrated is there's no expectation that after university you'll ever encounter translation theory or have the opportunity to uh, necessarily to, to study it. And, uh, and if you don't uh, at university, then precisely that's an opportunity that passes you by. I find it particularly encouraging that even someone working in translation management, which is not exactly the area where you would think that translation theory will become useful, mm -hmm. or uh, that the uh, revelation will come that oh, it, it can be useful, uh, but even there, uh, you can come to the realization. We have some students around, by the way, here, so you can, you can make your own judgment or, or make your own input. It'll be curious to hear that as well. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, sure. I'm just thinking about um, driving theory and test. Okay, I think you know, for the first time I'm thinking about myself, um, if you want to study, if you want to be a, a, you know, a writer in TV literary theory, uh, without actually carrying on, I thought, well, what about driving the driving theory test? And mm -hmm. Is it helpful to think that about theory as a a means to an end, so that you know the, when you nobody enjoys learning driving theory. Well, nobody enjoys it. People all enjoy learning driving theory. I didn't. And you know, it's just seen as oh, got to go through this. Got to, it's a bit like a module that you have to take in your program, isn't it? Um, and but then you use it, and you, it just becomes something that so you, you take it to reflect on what all the other things you need to know if you want to have gearbox works in your car, and it makes you a better driver. No, you just yes. mentioned what you should have done or should be doing, but you now can't call them this. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I got into translation theory because of you know the intellectual pursuit and, and because of the enjoyment I get out of that. But I mean, you're right. It's like you know, it's like the argument to you know why learn Latin at school? Well, you know, are you going to use it afterwards? Well, you know, for the rest of one's life, one you know, I'm glad I learned Latin at school. You know, for, I didn't know at the time what on earth you know benefits it was going to bring me. Probably. Uh, but I think, uh, as you were saying, you know, very often the benefits will be perceived only later. 